So for the last several generations, archaeologists have talked about a time period called the Hypsothermal. And this was a time when the environment shifted, well, the climate shifted in much of North America to be warmer and drier than it had been before, and also warmer and drier than it is today. Um, and I want to talk about this period a little bit because it gives me an opportunity to explain some of the methods that archaeologists use to reconstruct and understand what past climates were like. Hey, I'm Nathaniel Fossen. I'm a professional archaeologist, and this channel is devoted to the archaeology of North America, especially in the area that we call the Eastern Woodlands region, where I've worked for the last 10 years or so. Now, the Hypsothermal started around 9,000 years ago and lasted until about 5,000-ish years ago. So it corresponds roughly with what we call the Middle Archaic period. And one of the things that happened during this time period is that um, the tree canopy that was covering much of the eastern woodlands started to break up. It didn't go away altogether, but it started to fracture and grassland environments started to fill in those, those gaps. And we can see this pattern in the pollen record in general. So different plants will produce different sizes and shapes of pollen and these are identifiable under a microscope. So in stable hydrological environments like ponds and bogs and things like that, every year these plants throw out all this pollen, it settles on the surface of the water and then it sinks to the bottom. And this happens every year. So you end up getting stratified pollen records for all of those years. So we can take cores of the soil sediment from the bottom of those bogs and look at the ratios of the different pollens to get a sense of what the, uh, the plant life and environment were like over time because different plants thrive in different climates. So here's a chart of the pollen ratios from Cupola Pond in Missouri. And the timeline is over here on the left. So the farther down you go, the older the pollen sample is. And what you can see here is that between about 11,000 and 10,000 years ago, oak pollens became much more common, and then that starts to taper off a little bit here, and we see an increase in grass pollens. And then this reverses itself, and the grasses become less common again, and the oaks start to come back. There's also some faunal evidence for this process. For instance, at Little Freeman Cave in north centralish Missouri, uh, some bison remains were found showing that the uh, the prairie was starting to expand further into the Ozark uplands. And there's also a study of Rogers Shelter and Modoc Shelter uh, and their faunal assemblages, their animal, animal bone assemblages, looking at how the ratios between woodland associated taxa and uh, prairie associated taxa shift during this time period. And you do at certain points see increases, market increases, in the amount of prairie associated taxa. Now, another method that I want to talk about is called speleothem isotope analysis. So speleothems are those formations in caves that we call stalactites and stalagmites, the spikes that are growing from the top and the bottom of the cave. There are minerals that are dissolved in water and water's running through these caves and it's, it's depositing these and they're building up into these, these conic shapes over thousands of years. So up above the cave at the surface, it, it rains. And then the rainwater percolates through the soil and picks up a bunch of carbon from decaying plant material. And that water then reaches the water table and it starts flowing. And in a karst environment, it gets into caves and these things start to um, get deposited, creating the speleothems. They, they've got a lot of carbon in them. So when the vegetation at the surface has a lot of trees, then those carbonates that are being deposited in the speleothems will have a high 
carbon-12 isotope composition. This is because trees and most other plants have what's called a C3 photosynthetic pathway. Plants that do this form of photosynthesis discriminate against carbon dioxide that has those heavier carbon isotopes. They, they go after the light C12 carbon, and they don't like the uh, those extra neutrons on the carbon atom from the you know, C13s and so on. So they, they're mostly just taking on the C12 isotope, the carbon-12 isotope. On the other hand, there are these grasses that are adapted to warmer, drier climates, which have what we call a C4 photosynthetic pathway. And uh, incidentally, corn is one of these C4 plants, maize. It's not really relevant to the hypsothermal because it would be another like 4,000 years before maize got imported into the eastern woodlands. But I might end up talking about some of the analyses we can do uh, with that in, in a future video. So these C4 grasses allow air into tiny chambers in their, you know, like leafy materials when they're photosynthesizing. And those chambers close up, they use all of the carbon dioxide that's in the chamber, they open back up and then they let another source of air in. So they're not discriminating against those heavier carbon isotopes. So when you have a proliferation of these grasses, then the groundwater doesn't get depleted in the C13, the carbon-13. Whereas if you've got a bunch of trees up at the surface and that's what's decaying, you get a enriched carbon-12 signature. So not unlike trees, speleothems grow by adding layers to the exterior. So the inside is gonna be much older than the outside. And so these layers can be dated using an argon thorium uh, dating method, which I'm not going to get into the details of right now. It's similar to radiocarbon dating, though. And um, back around, I guess, 20 years ago or so, uh, several studies by Ron Denniston and uh, some, of, some of their colleagues analyzed speleothem samples from several caves in the Ozarks, uh, Missouri and Arkansas predominantly. And they not only found evidence for this grassland expansion in those speleothems, that increasing C13 signature, they also were able to, because they took these samples from multiple areas across the region, were able to see that it didn't all start at the same time. Um, the changes appear to have started in the eastern Ozarks and then in the southwest and then finally in the northwest part of the Ozarks. So this is a cool method because in karst environments like the Ozarks, uh, stable ponds aren't really common. They're, they're really rare. So getting pollen data generally isn't feasible. Um, that water is going to percolate into the karst formations and, and run off. So the pollen method and the speleothem method can be used in, in concert with each other in order to reconstruct uh, at very broad scales what uh, how climate was changing in the past over um, large regions uh, and how those changes differed from each other region to region. So I hope that uh, that was largely coherent. Um, if you have any questions about that, you can leave those in the comments. And as always, thank you for watching.